Hi, I'm Kyle Harrison. This is our PEA and asystole lecture as part of our ongoing ACLS review and CRM principles for our iPad app. So uh, let's get started. So as before, um, the approach to any pulseless patient is the same. It's always starting with your compressions and then moving to your airway and then ventilation or breathing. Obviously, if you have more help, then you can start um, with compressions and then the, the person doing the airway and the breathing can start that, that quickly. Um, but if you're alone, you start with compressions. The key is to always go with compressions first. Um, you're gonna do at least 100 uh, times a minute and you're gonna give uh, allow for complete chest recoil because this is, uh, as we talked about before, this is the how you generate the effectiveness of your compressions. Um, and you wanna push at least two inches because you need um, to really get that uh, full uh, de uh, full compression and then full recoil decompression. Um, it's important that you're going to administer oxygen um, and uh, in advanced settings, you're going to actually ventilate the patient um, with uh, either bag mass ventilation, uh, laryngeal mask airway, or endotracheal tube, um, but you're not going to overventilate, so your goal is gonna be eight to 10 breaths per minute. Um, and then if uh, this patient is uh, uh, not on a monitored setting, you're gonna attach the monitor so you can decide what rhythm that you're dealing with. So um, you walk in, you find the patient unresponsive um, and, and not breathing, you're immediately gonna start compressions. Then you're gonna, as help arrives, they're gonna start ventilating. Um, you're gonna hook up to the monitor and then you're gonna decide, is this a shockable rhythm? So your first assessment of the rhythm is gonna be, is this shockable? If so, then you're going to switch to your V-fib, V-T pathway, which would, uh, which would be uh, uh, a defibrillation. But if this is a non shock rhythm, then you're going to continue CPR. And then uh, you're immediately going to try and get intravenous access. Now, intravenous access may be challenging. So the new guidelines encourage early interosseous administration because these patients, especially for PEA, you're gonna to need to get vasopressors in early. This is unlike the V-fib where the primary goal is CPR and defibrillation. The primary goal for PA is compressions and give your vasopressor. So you need to get intravenous access quickly. Um, so if you're not able to establish IV access, then switch to interosseous. And we'll have a module on this uh, later. Um, once you've established your access, you can administer either one milligram of epinephrine or you can select 40 units of vasopressin, and that's, once again, a single dose times one. The epinephrine, you're gonna repeat every three to five minutes throughout the resuscitation. As you uh, proceed uh, further down the algorithm, um, after you've achieved your IV access, then you're gonna maintain, or you're gonna secure a, a, an advanced airway technique, um, or choose an advanced airway technique. So if you intubate regularly, you can place it in a tracheal tube. If you don't, you can place the laryngeal mask airway. Once again, we'll go over this in the airway uh, module. Um, you're going to establish continuous CO2 monitoring um, so that you can monitor the quality of the CPR uh, as well as assess for return of circulation and also to maintain uh, that you've actually uh, intubated the trachea uh, or established adequate bag mass ventilation with an LMA. Um, and use the CO2 for continuous assessment of that uh, effective ventilation, effective compressions, etc. Then you're going to start searching for the treatable causes. And then these things are all going to be kind of rolling together. I mean, you're obviously going to assign someone using workload distribution to secure the airway, and then you can start looking for the treatable causes. Um, if you assign someone to get an intravenous access and start giving the first vasopressor, then you can start working on the treatable causes sooner but this is just a framework to kind of move down the line. But you're gonna to wanna to look for these treatable causes pretty early because um, if you have a treatable cause, you need to treat it, obviously, otherwise you're not gonna be successful in the resuscitation. So as you're doing this, as always, continuous high quality CPR. Um, how do you know that? And how do you know if you're doing good CPR? Well, you're going to use the two determinants uh, that we've talked about before of high quality CPR. And one is a uh, adequate entitled CO2, so you're using continuous capnometry, and you're gonna get an entitled CO2 of greater than 10. If it's less, then you need to improve your CPR quality or give uh, more vasopressor. 
Um, the second option is to monitor your diastolic pressure with compressions. This is easier done with an A-line. Uh, if you don't, you can try and use the non-invasive cuff, which may be challenging. But your goal is to keep a diastolic pressure, which in CPR, basically, that's the pressure with chest recoil of at least 20 millimeters of mercury. So greater than 10 for entitled, greater than 20 for diastolic pressure. If you have, if these two numbers are, are um, if you're achieving greater than these two minimum numbers, then your CPR quality is good. If you're not, you need to improve them. You're going to repeat your epinephrine every three to five minutes. Um, once again, that's going to be hard to keep track of, so you're going to task someone to have a clock, either the pharmacist or the recording nurse, to say, I need you to let me know when we're getting close to the next dose. You can pre-plan to have the pharmacist prepare it so it's ready to go as soon as it's time to go, but you're not going to want to give too much in the sense that you'll need to give it every three to five minutes, but don't give it more frequently than that, otherwise you end up in very high doses of epinephrine, which could be detrimental. If any time throughout the resuscitation the patient changes their rhythm to a shockable rhythm, which may happen, then you need to defibrillate that, because the only treatment for a shockable rhythm is defibrillation. And as you run through your treatable causes, you're going to need to re-review them, because things may change. You may have started with one treatable cause, and a second one may pop up. So an example is maybe this patient was severely hypovolemic and you start uh, treating that cause and maybe they get a little better and you start getting intravascular volume in, but then the CPR causes a, a, a pneumothorax, which then could maybe develop a tension pneumo. So, you know, although uh, usually it's a single cause in these environments, sometimes you can have multiple causes and one uh, follows another. So you constantly need to reassess um, your treatable causes until you have effective return of circulation. Now, say systole, how is that different than PEA? Well, basically PEA is, is an organized electrical rhythm without a pulse. Uh, asystole is basically no rhythm. It's the final pathway. So all, all rhythms eventually end up in asystole. It's the final common pathway. Now, it's important when you are presented with a patient with asystole, you need to decide, A, is it real? And B, is it potentially another rhythm. So what I mean by real is uh, if the patient's not connected to the monitor appropriately, it may look to some people like it's asystole. Almost all monitors have a difference between a disconnect, which is a dotted line, and a truly asystolic patient, which is a solid line. So if you're ever uncertain, just make sure the leads are attached and, uh, and maybe check in two different leads to see um, to make sure that it truly is asystole and not another rhythm. The other issue is that there may be times that the patient has very fine B-fib, so it's going to look very fine and maybe it may be misinterpreted as asystole. So you want to make sure that it's not B-fib because that is a shock rhythm. So once again, changing leads um, with the defibrillator, uh, putting on additional lead sets may help you if you're in that, uh, in that issue. Um, things with asystole that are not indicated, new, this is new, so it may change how you do this. You don't use the pacemaker. The transcutaneous pacemaking, pacemaker is no longer indicated in asystole. It um, used to be on the algorithm. It's no longer. Um, shows no benefit in, in the study, so it's been removed. The other thing that's not indicated is asystole, uh, shocking asystole. Basically, you should not defibrillate an asystolic patient. If there's any question that it's fine V-fib, you should try and rule it out. And if it is fine V-fib, clearly you'll defibrillate that, but you're not going to routinely defibrillate the systole. In fact, it may worsen the outcome. It's kind of hard to say how you can make it any worse because you're in asystole, but you know they've actually just studied this and it may worsen your outcome. So don't routinely shock flight line. Um, don't use the transcutaneous pacemaker on asystole. So now let's get to the big treatable causes, because these are the ones, you know, we've talked about before in other modules, cognitive aid use. This is the quintessential best time to use your cognitive aid. You've got things that are a long laundry list of things that, that could be causing this uh, patient to be in arrest, and you may get 9 out of the 10, but if you miss the 10th, you know, that's a 90% on a test, but that's not going to get the patient back. So you really need to force yourself to review all of these causes uh, and re-review them. And so the Cognivate is a great uh, an aid to help you with this. So 
let's go over them. These are the, the kind of the H's and the T's that you may have heard before. So in the H's, uh, we have hypovolemia, hypoxemia, hydrogen ion, acid, which is basically acidosis, um, hypoglycemia, hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, and uh, hypothermia. Uh, and additionally, you can add uh, hypocalcemia as well um, to this list. Uh, the T's, um, tablets, uh, which is basically overdoses, and this is a broad definition. So this is patient's medications, this is uh, ingested uh, both prescribed and illicit medications, this is medications given to the patient in the hospital setting, this is infusions that are running, and keep it a broad differential when you think of tablets. Um, tamponade, cardiac tamponade, uh, tension pneumothorax, uh, thrombosis, both coronary and thrombosis pulmonary or pulmonary embolus. Um, these are the T's. But, you know, um, you may ask yourself, uh, how do you rule out these causes? You know, it's a long list and it's fine to just say, you know, these are the causes, but it's really when the rubber meets the road, you as a leader need to decide, is it one or another? Um, and how do you rule these out? So I think one of the best ways to do that, you've got two options that you can quickly rule out a lot of these causes. One is obtaining a arterial, or if you can't get arterial access, a venous blood gas. Um, and if you run this, the, the, it's important to know blood gas cartridges, you can do these actually at a point of care in a lot of hospitals. They actually have machines uh, that are, are portable um, that your rapid response team may have or you may be able to get access to. If not, you can send these to the lab for stat analysis. But it's important that when they run the sample, they also run the associated test with them, uh, which include a glucose, hematocrit, and electrolytes. By doing that, you're going to get to be able to assess your acid base status. Now, obviously, arterial blood is better for assessing the acidemia than a venous, but if you have to do venous, you can do venous. You're going to be able to assess your electrolytes, so you're going to have potassium, your calcium. Um, you're going to be able to assess your hemoglobin and hematocrit to know are they very anemic and you're going to be able to check your glucose to rule out hypoglycemia. So one test is going to take about half of those things off the differential. So it's important to test those early. And the next thing you can do to help rule things out, a transthoracic echo. Now this is going to take several other things off the differential. It's going to help you rule out tamponade. If you may be able to see a, a, a clot for a pulmonary embolus. You may see hypovolemia uh, with a, uh, you know, a hyperdynamic but underfilled heart. Uh, and you may see uh, complete lack of contractility, which may be a sign of a severe MI or, or maybe just a very poor prognosis for resuscitation if you have basically the classic stone heart that's not moving at all. So valuable information. Once again, if you don't have this skill set, you have to find someone who can do this. Um, so you can anticipate and plan, call for that resource early, uh, but uh, I encourage you to, to get additional training on this skill because uh, emergent uh, basic transthoracic echo is a very useful skill to have um, uh, on your team. So let's go through them one by one and we'll talk about uh, how you rule them out and how you treat them. So hypovolemia, it's the most common cause of PEA arrest, um, the, uh, whether it's uh, from uh, uh, hemorrhagic shock um, uh, or uh, severe dehydration, um, uh, but most common cause, the treatment is a rapid IV bolus um, of, of crystalloid, um, either IV or IO. Um, if, if the patient is uh, truly only hypovolemic, uh, you start giving the, the fluid back, they're going to get a pulse back, especially if you give uh, the epi. Um, you want to send a stat to hematocrit to rule out hemorrhagic shock. Um, and if they're really actively bleeding, or if they have a very low hematocrit, you may need to transfuse the patient. Uh, you may need to use O negative if the patient doesn't have a type and cross. Uh, you want to get that blood in quickly if that's the cause. Um, and uh, always keep your mind out that an occult GI bleed, you know, just because you don't see the bleeding. Um, a, a patient that's been bleeding in their gut, um, especially in the hospitalized setting, uh, maybe uh, no one realized that the patient had a GI bleed and uh, this could result in a, a hypovolemic P air arrest. So always keep that uh, in the back of your mind. Not uncommon in hospitalized patients, and obviously the most common cause in all arrest. Second most common cause, hypoxemia. So this is the second most common cause in adults. It's the most common cause in pediatrics. 
um, the treatment for this is um, obviously you're going to administer 100% oxygen and then start ventilating the patient. Um, but if you're in an arrest situation, you can't overventilate. So you've got to appropriately oxygenate, appropriate ventilate, but don't overventilate. Once again, shooting for about eight to 10 breaths per minute. Um, even if they're hypoxic, you can't make up the difference if they're with the overventilating uh, and giving big tidal breaths because it's going to disrupt your your compression. So, and in a compressive state, you got to you got to go slow and and go brief with the ventilation. Um, once again, most patients, if unless it's a terminal event uh, and they've been down too long, as long as you administer the oxygen, they'll probably come back. If it was from hypoxemia, next cause: hydrogen ion acidosis. So metabolic acidosis. Now this is the one that's interesting. So it's the chicken or the egg. All you, you're doing a resting patient and they're very acidemic. Is that because they've been down for a while or is it because they had a pre-existing acidemia from either severe sepsis or hypoperfusion or, 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 or uh, acid, uh, you know, uh, RTA from a renal disease? You know, is that the cause uh, or is it because they just, like I said, been down for a long time with poor perfusion. So you have to kind of make that assessment because acidemia that preceded the arrest, that's when you can consider treating with sodium bicarbonate. But if it's just acidemic from the arrest, then your goal is to treat the underlying cause and improve compressions, and then that acidemia will hopefully improve. But routine use of bicarb is not indicated and should not be, should not be used. Hypoglycemia, once again, uh, not a common cause, but a potentially obviously very treatable cause, um, either using uh, finger stick uh, blood glucose, which is rapidly available um, on most wards, or sending it with a uh, AVG. Treatment for this will be one amp of D50 um, and continue to monitor the glucoses after that. Hyperkalemia or hypokalemia. Um, hyperkalemia is actually the more common cause of, of an arrest. Um, often a ventricular fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, but it may be actually result in PEA as well. The treatment for this, um, you can you know rule it out with a, once again not stat electrolytes or off your blood gas. But once you've confirmed hyperkalemia, uh, uh, or you have a high index of suspicion, so you have uh, very peak T waves on your ECG, um, then you can uh, assume hyperkalemia uh, potentially. You're going to treat it with calcium chloride, usually one gram. You can give one amp of sodium bicarbonate. These are things to help a, a stabilize the cardiac membrane and b start driving the potassium back into the cells out of the extracellular space. Uh, the glucose and insulin. So you're actually using the insulin to drive the the potassium in, and using glucose to prevent hypoglycemia. Um, these will help stabilize. Uh, other options: emergent hemodialysis, even though it's probably not very practical. Uh, in an arresting patient, but it's something you can consider. And then hypokalemia. Um, so the treatment for this would be a, a, a slow but controlled infusion. You don't want to bang it in. You can't push potassium. That'll cause hyperkalemia, which will cause uh, badness. Um, so a controlled infusion. Um, and if they're that hyperkalemic that they're causing this much instability, they're probably hypomagnesemic as well. And so you should treat them both together You'll have better luck at getting the potassium elevated if you give magnesium for this patient. Next, hypothermia. So this is really, for the most part, only an issue for out-of-hospital arrest um, because you know a hypothermic patient in the hospital has just been dead for a while. So uh, these are the patients that come in from the outside. Uh, they've been submerged in cold water. Or they were found in, in, uh, in the snow. Uh, uh, these are the ones where. You, the old adage is you're not dead until you're warm and dead. So um, active warming means uh, maybe even using cardiopulmonary bypass. You may have a prolonged resuscitation, but it's you need to resuscitate these cold patients until they're warm because the brain is actually protected in that state and there have been good neurological recovery even after a very long downtime. So um, active warming uh, through uh, warm saline lavage, uh, or active warming actually on the cardiopulmonary bypass may be indicated for these cases. Tablets, uh, so we talked about overdose, um, whether or not this is accidental or intentional ingestion of, of drugs, both prescribed or illicit. Um, in a hospital setting, you want to review what the patient's been receiving, um, consider drug errors, 
because uh, if it's not adding up, maybe the patient got the wrong drug. If you're in, a, in, an, in an intensive care unit or in, the, in a setting where the patient's receiving intravenous medications or an infusion, you want to stop all those infusions because maybe it's a drug swap or maybe one infusion was misprogrammed and going, uh, for example, they inadvertently started Nipride when they were trying to start another drug, which would obviously cause severe hypotension and maybe an arrest. So uh, stop all the infusions um, until you know what's happening uh, with these patients. Uh, or at least confirm that the infusions are running the way you think they are. You want to administer uh, any antidotes that you know that uh, that you have for specific uh, overdoses. So uh, local anesthetics uh, that can cause uh, you know lidocaine, bupivacaine, ropivacaine, bupivacaine. All the uh, local anesthetics can cause cardiac toxicity, can cause a cardiac arrest. The treatment for this is 20% interlipid. Now this is some new data. Um, that uh, has been shown to very much improve outcome. Um, and the interlipid actually works as, uh, as what we call lipid sink and allows that local to bind uh, up that local anesthetic that um, helps remove it from the circulation. Um, of note, this lipid sink theory, 20% interlipid, works for a lot of different agents. So um, it's been reported for other calcium and sodium channel blocking agents, I mean, for tricyclics. So, Something to think about uh, for any of these drug overdoses, it may be uh, useful, something to explore further. Tricyclics, uh, you're gonna use sodium bicarbonate to change the pH balance. Beta blockers, you can use glucagon. Calcium channel blockers, you can use glucagon or calcium chloride. Um, these are all potential um, uh, options. Once again, consider emergent hemodialysis or cardiopulmonary bypass if these patients uh, you know, the overdose, uh, may, you just may need to support them until the, the pharmacokinetics of the drug clear. Um, so that's something that will take resources. So you have to think about that um, as a leader and get those uh, balls rolling uh, sooner than later if you're going to utilize these techniques. Tamponade. Once again, if you don't see it, if you don't look for it, you'll never find it. So uh, high index of suspicion uh, for this condition. So any recent trauma, uh, a strong clinical history, uh, for example, the guy, uh, you know, a pericardial rub on exam, um, patient that has end-stage renal disease is more prone to uremic uh, effusions, um, uh, you know, like I said, chest trauma, uh, recent central line access, uh, even a central line placed, uh, sometimes the tip of a, of a central line can perforate the right atrium and cause tamponade. So high index of suspicion, um, transthoracic echo confirms this diagnosis. Um, and then the treatment is emergent needle de-evacuation, needle uh, decompression of, of the pericardial space through a zeb siphoid approach. Once again, you may not feel comfortable doing this, so contact teammates that might. Uh, obviously, your cardiac surgeon will be comfortable helping you. Uh, maybe the cardiologist um, and uh, a, th a trauma surgeon, emergency physician. These are different uh, resources that you as team leader can mobilize to help with this. Next one, tension pneumothorax. Once again, common in a hospital setting. If you don't look for it, you'll never find it, and it's completely treatable. Um, but if you don't treat it, you're not going to get them back. So high index of suspicion again, high, high index of suspicion again, just like the pericardial uh, fusion. Uh, so COPD patients on the ventilator, high risk for this. And once again, recent trauma, chest trauma, uh, recent central access or attempted central access. Um, you're going to notice potentially decreased breath sounds uh, on the affected side. If you put a cuss to the chest, you might notice hyperresonance on the affected side. Um, you may be able to identify this with transthoracic. Um, if there's a large air collection, uh, as, you, as you evaluate the heart, you might notice a very um, significant uh, uh, air pocket um, uh, outside of the pericardial space. And then you're going to treat this. Once again, a needle decompression, the second intercostal space, mid-clavicular line. You place a 14 or 16 gauge needle, decompress the chest. Uh, you should hear a whoosh of air, um, and you will see a pretty dramatic improvement in your uh, cardiopulmonary status. Um, your your uh, blood pressure should improve pretty rapidly if it's a tension pneumo. Um, and then you'll need to put a definitive chest tube in to uh, continue to uh, prevent the um, ongoing uh, and uh, tension from redeveloping. Coronary thrombosis, so once again, having a clinical history, 
You may notice in a PEA patient, maybe they have ST elevation um, on the ECG. You can consider emergent PCI. Um, you can take the patients to the cath lab under doing CPR. It's a decision you have to make with your cardiology consult uh, and, and how you can mobilize those resources. Consider anaerobic balloon pump. Um, and the one thing that's not indicated is uh, thrombolysis. Once again, the thought in the old days was that maybe you could give TPA for these patients and it would improve their outcome. The studies have not shown that, so routine um, thrombolysis for a patient and full arrest from an MI is not indicated at this time. Pulmonary embolus. Now, uh, this is once again a high index of suspicion. Um, you know, is this patient post-op, post-op day two or three? They've been mo um, uh, in, in bed, haven't been anticoagulated. Um, sudden onset of respiratory distress then results in rapid decompensation from the cardiovascular standpoint, uh, resulting in PE arrest. These are things to think about. Um, the TE may show RV strain, may show failure, or may actually even show a frank thrombus in the, in the RV outflow tract. That would be pretty, um, pretty strong uh, uh, data to support that, that this was a PE. Has been shown that saddle embolus, either known or very highly likely, uh, I mean, it's a very strong index of suspicion. These patients do benefit from potentially from thrombolysis. So, decision you have to make at the moment, but the data is more supportive. We said not for MIs, but for severe PE, TPA or uh, streptokinase may be indicated. So you need to decide that. If you're going to use that, get the pharmacy to mix it. It's once again a resource you have to mobilize. So I'm going to review quickly our PEA uh, and once again asystole, they're the same. The treatments are the same. Um, so you've got high quality CPR, support the circulation with vasopressors, epi, and then a single dose of vasopressin. You're going to search for the treatable causes, run the list, then you're going to rerun the list looking for other causes that may have developed as the arrest progresses, uh, and then you're going to rerun the list if the patient decompensates again. So you get them back and they recode, rerun the list because it may be a new finding that uh, was a result of maybe the original arrest therapy. For example, patient developed a pneumo from the chest compressions. Real important to constantly reassess um, and re-review. And that's it for our review of PEA and systole. Thanks.